And I don't believe we have Vicki yet, but she'll introduce herself later on when we get to the question and answer session. Um, our rough plan today is to uh, talk a little bit about Eugene O'Neill and introduce him to you. He is America's only Nobel Prize winning playwright, wrote 51 plays, and um, he is also uh, the playwright that has most notably brought realism to American drama. So you can't see a play in America today without um, seeing some of that influence of Eugene O'Neill. So as we, um, we're going to have a video presentation that lasts about 25 minutes long. And then um, after that, we will have a question and answer session. We can answer any questions you might have about the video or visiting our park. Um, as you watch the video, I'd like to just kind of float a question for you to kind of ponder and think about. Um, Eugene O'Neill was, um, he was very famous in his day when he was writing his plays and when his plays were being performed, he uh, was very successful and was a, definitely a person of his time. He reflected the culture of his day and the, and the culture surrounding him um, heavily influenced his work. So I'd like you to think about um, how does this story um, apply to current events and how do you feel like it, it touches you? Um, so with that, um, do we want to do anything else, Ben, before we get started with the video performance? Um, no, I think um, the floor is yours for the video. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Danville, California. My name is Hillary, and I'd like to welcome you to your virtual tour of Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site. Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site is one of 424 National Park units in the National Park System. Located on a hillside in the San Ramon Valley, this site was once the home of Eugene O'Neill, a prolific and award-winning playwright, his wife, Carlotta Monterey, and their beloved Dalmatian dog, Silverdine Emblem, better known as Blummy. Dow House was the home of the O'Neills from 1937 to 1944. During their years here, Eugene would write and complete the final three plays of his life. The Second World War would take its toll on the O'Neills and the nation, and Dear Blemmy would pass away. When Eugene and Carlotta moved into Dow House on December 30th, 1937, they thought that this would be their permanent home for the rest of their lives, but that was not to be. Before I take you into the house, I wanna tell you about how visitors take an in-person tour and then show you some points of interest on the grounds. Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site is unique in that it is nestled between a private gated community and the beautiful Las Trampas Regional Wilderness Park, which is a wonderful green space managed by the East Bay Regional Park District. Tours of Dow House are offered Wednesday through Sunday at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Reservations are required every day except for Saturday when tours are offered on a first come first serve basis. To reach the site, you will catch our shuttle that collects people from in front of the Museum of the San Ramon Valley located at 205 Railroad Avenue. Now that you have reached the grounds via a virtual shuttle, let's take a look at what is located in the field surrounding Dow House. On both sides of the house, there are restored fruit and nut orchards that provide seasonal snacks to the many native bird species who call this region home. In front of Dow House and the courtyard, there are two barns, one painted white and the other brown. The white old barn predates the O'Neill's time in Danville and the brown new barn was built by a family who lived here after the O'Neill's. Beyond the new barn, you would discover Blummy's headstone. On the headstone is Blummy's last will and testament written in his own voice by a bereaved Eugene. Turning around behind Dow House, just down the hillside, is Eugene's pool. He would have swum in it most afternoons. Now that we've explored the grounds, let's enter the walled courtyard and get our first glance at Dow House. Pay attention to the Chinese characters on the door to the courtyard. Inside, we step onto a zigzag path and cross the yard towards the front of the home. Dow House is a combination of architectural and artistic styles drawing heavily upon the cultural appropriation of Taoism and Chinese design that was popular at the time. 
The O'Neills designed their yard around a chinaberry tree and had other shrubs and trees planted to provide additional shade during the summer months. Eugene suffered from multiple physical and mental health complications during his life. This is reflected in his plays, but also by Carlotta's dedication to supporting his work and creating a calm and peaceful home for him to continue to write. Let's enter the home. I want to show you the common areas of the house and tell you more about the lives of Eugene and Carlotta. Here we are in Rosie's room. Eugene was the son of James O'Neill and Ella Quinlan. James was a traveling actor, famous for his role in the play Monte Cristo. Ella supported James's career and sadly spent much of her adult life struggling with morphine addiction. James and Ella had three sons, though it is important to note that their second son, Edmund, died when he was a toddler. Edmund's death would weigh heavily upon the O'Neill family and would frame Eugene's sense of self throughout his life. After Edmund passed away, James wished for another child. Ella had reservations. Two years later, while giving birth to Eugene, Ella, his mother, was administered morphine. Eugene spent his life feeling as if he was Edmund's unwanted understudy and the root cause of his mother's addiction. Eugene and Carlotta had no biological children together. Eugene had Eugene Jr., Shane, and Una from his earlier marriages, and Carlotta had a daughter, Cynthia, from an earlier relationship. During their many years together, they would refer to Blemmy as their child, saying he was their only child who never disappointed them and the plays written at Dow House were also referred to as their offspring. Here in this room, there is a bay window with a wonderful view of Mount Diablo in the distance. A player piano, the Rosie for whom this room is named, is against the wall. The walls are covered with framed photographs of friends and family. On the wall opposite Rosie is a large map of Europe mounted above their radio, where Eugene would have listened to events unfolding in the war and followed the movement of troops across the European continent. Now let us step out into the hallway and make our way into the living room. The brick walls painted white, a fireplace at the far end, and the room filled with imported Qing Dynasty and French country furniture. The bookshelves set into the walls are filled with copious volumes of books. On the right side is a large blue mirror and opposite a large open bookcase. Many visitors ask, did there used to be a window here? The answer is no. Carlotta had vision problems that would have made so much light difficult for her. Rather, there was a Chinese decorative coral mandal screen mounted in the space between the two smaller windows. This room would have been a space for Eugene, Carlotta, and Blemmy to casually spend their evenings taking advantage of the many books that line the walls. The O'Neills entertain guests from time to time, family friends, business associates, and their respective children. Cynthia, Carlotta's daughter, along with her husband and young son, were regular visitors, and there were times when Eugene's children would visit for a few days at a time. Thankfully, both of the O'Neills regularly wrote in their diaries, and this has provided us a unique window into their family and social lives. Thank you for exploring Dow House with me. Now I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Altman, who is going to show you around the upstairs. Hi, I'm Ranger Altman, and I'm here to share with you the upstairs rooms of Dow House. These were the most private spaces in the O'Neill's already secluded home, and even the infrequent visitors to Dow House during the time that the O'Neill's lived here would not have been invited upstairs. Not even if the house is on fire is the master to be disturbed, said Carlotta of the playwright's devotion to his study. The O'Neills had few visitors to Dow House in the 30s and 40s, and as we pass the Temple Lions or Foo Dogs and begin our walk to the second story of the home, it's important to remember that these symbols serve the same purpose that they do at the gates of Chinatown in San Francisco. They're protecting the most private and personal spaces of the O'Neills' already secluded home. Carlotta's suite is a large room with exposed block walls and a set of bay windows that looks out on Mount Diablo. There's a dog bed in the corner and books in the shelves. A passageway leads through her closet into the bathroom. Carlotta Monterey was born Hazel Farsing in Oakland, California, the same year that Eugene O'Neill was born in New York City. Raised throughout most of her childhood by an aunt, at age 19, Hazel wins the Miss California Beauty Contest put on by the San Francisco Calm newspaper a contest judged by two painters and a sculptor. At the time, she's living in London. 
taking singing lessons, enrolled in what would later become the Royal Academy of Art. There she meets her first husband in a fencing class, a marriage that lasts for three years. Against her mother's wishes, Hazel, now going by the name and identity by which we know her best, pursues a career on the stage, taking first a series of roles in Europe and then in New York City. On a visit to her mother in 1916, she meets her second husband with whom she has a child, Cynthia, on the advice of her acting coach, who believes that motherhood will improve her theatrical skills. Not wanting motherhood to encumber her career, however, Carlotta will give the child to her mother to raise, and she divorces for a second time. In April 1922, Carlotta is cast as the upper-class female lead in a much-anticipated new play, Eugene O'Neill's The Hairy Ape. The playwright and the actress were reportedly unimpressed with each other. O'Neill was known to find all actors somehow insufficient, and Carlotta, by her turn, called Jean the rudest man I'd ever seen. The play, however, is a great success. She enters into her third marriage with cartoonist and illustrator Ralph Barton, who is part of the New York City Society set with the photographer Carl Van Vechten and the illustrator Miguel Covarrubias, with whom Eugene O'Neill is good friends, as well as the actor Charlie Chaplin, with whom Eugene O'Neill is not. Two years after that, 1926, the O'Neills, Jean, Agnes, Shane, and Una vacation in Maine and are invited to the home of literary agent and theatrical producer Elizabeth Marbury, who herself has a summer house guest, a now three times divorced Carlotta Monterey. Jean wants to swim in the lake, and Ms. Marbury asks Carlotta to show him the bathhouse where he might change. When he emerges, he does so wearing the only suit he could find, a greatly overlarge women's bathing costume. From this inauspicious reintroduction, Eugene and Carlotta fall into a relationship that takes them to France, Shanghai, Sea Island, Georgia, all over the world for a decade, until they decide to look for a final home and harbor in the rural San Ramon Valley of California. Mother, wife, mistress, friend, and collaborator. This is how Eugene O'Neill inscribed the manuscript of Morning Becomes Electra to Carlotta. And from that litany, one gets the sense that their relationship was complex on many levels. He often refers to the plays that he writes as our offspring. And Carlotta's journals are filled with descriptions of her day-to-day -day work transcribing and typing Jean's handwritten notes and revisions. As O'Neill's health deteriorated, this work would take up more and more of Carlotta's life, and any discussion of O'Neill's contributions to the theater would be incomplete without a recognition of Carlotta's role in it, especially during his time at Dow House, when he would write his most enduring masterpieces. Here we are in Carlotta's bedroom and suite. Around the room, you'll find some of her personal effects one of her many Louis Vuitton trunks, and some of her clothing. Out the window and through the door to the balcony is a beautiful view of Mount Diablo. And in the corner is the bed of one more Dow House denizen, the House Dalmatian, affectionately known as Blemmy. Blemmy was dear to Jean and Carlotta. Carlotta writes to one of her friends that Blemmy was the only one of our children who never disappointed us. That's a fairly cutting remark when you know that at the time, Jean and Carlotta had four living human children between them, but nevertheless, Blemmy was a kept dog. He had a raincoat from the Hermes Design House in Paris. He ate ground sirloin from his meals, and in the basement, a bathtub was installed, especially for washing him. When he died, it was a deep blow to the O'Neills. Blemmy is buried here on site, and if you visit the gravesite, take some time to read the interpretive panel on which is printed the text of the last will and testament of a very distinguished dog. It's a curious and interesting piece of writing from the pen of O'Neill himself 
done in the voice of Blemmy on the conceit that Blemmy himself had placed the words in his master's mind to be remembered in the event of the dog's death. Eugene's bedroom is styled after sea fog. Windows look out on the orchards and the courtyard. A black mirror is on the wall, and his bed dominates the space. A doorway opens into his bathroom, and behind us are his ever-present bookshelves filled with favorite volumes. The fog was where I wanted to be. Halfway down the path, you can't see this house. You'd never know it was here. I couldn't see but a few feet ahead, and I didn't meet a soul. Everything looked and sounded unreal. Nothing was what it is. And that's what I wanted, to be alone with myself in another world where truth is untrue and life can hide from itself. Eugene O'Neill wrote those words here at Dow House to give to the character of Edmund in Long Day's Journey into Night. And as we look around Eugene O'Neill's bedroom, we see the color scheme from the rest of the house begin to change. No more are those dark blues and heavy browns so prominent. Instead, we're surrounded, walls and ceiling, by a very foggy gray. And that sense of fogginess is accentuated by the mirror behind me, the last of the three colored mirrors in the house. This one tinted black. Now, earlier in his life, O'Neill was told by a friend, you're the most conceited man I ever met. You can't pass a mirror without looking at yourself in it. O'Neill thought a moment and responded, no, it isn't that. I'm just checking to make sure I still exist. You might notice that in this tinted mirror, your edges aren't quite as clear as they would be in a typical silvered mirror. Where you end and the image of the objects around you begins isn't quite as clear. And I want you to keep that sensation in mind as we move on and talk about the study. Well, before we do that, I want to draw your attention to one more key artifact here in the bedroom. It's Eugene O'Neill's original bed. This is a Chinese carved teakwood Arhitz couch purchased at Gump's in San Francisco, like so much of the other furniture in the house. It would have had a pillowy mattress top when O'Neill was sleeping on it. And when the O'Neills moved out of Dow House, they sold all that furniture back to Gump's. Well, if we flash forward to the 1990s, when the Eugene O'Neill Foundation and the National Park Service is looking to refurbish the home with some of those original pieces, well, it was discovered that this couch bed was still there in the Gump's showroom. The foundation contacted the store to see if they'd be interested in donating Eugene O'Neill's bed back into Eugene O'Neill's bedroom. They were reluctant, understandably so. They were proud to have been the supplier to the O'Neills during their time here in California? Well, the actress Katherine Hepburn wrote a letter. Hepburn portrayed Mary Tyrone in the 1960s filmed version of Long Day's Journey Into Night. This is what she said. Dear Gumps, what can I give you that would pay you back for the bed you have which belonged to Eugene O'Neill? I understand there was originally a Chinese opium table of carved teak. I know that they've already approached you and that you've not responded to any of their conversations. They are desperate. Can it mean that much to you? Think and be kind. You are Gumps. And sure enough, Gumps called back the very next day. We'll move on to Eugene O'Neill's writing room now. And as we do, I want you to glance at some of the titles of the books that are on the shelves here in the bedroom. These are some of O'Neill's favorite detective novels. For such a serious dramatist, the material that he wanted to keep closest at hand in his bedroom were books about ships and pulp mystery fictions. As we pass through O'Neill's closet into his study, we see the passage from sea fog into the captain's quarters of a ship. Two desks fill the space. There are many, many volumes of books on the shelves, and nautical artifacts sit next to them and on the surface of the desks themselves. The ceiling has exposed beams, and past the desks is a sun porch where Eugene would rest in the middle of long working sessions. The overall effect is warmth and containment. And here we are in the most removed and private space of Dow House. 
This study is where Eugene O'Neill would complete the last plays that he would ever write in his life. It's very much as it would have been when the O'Neills were living here. The desk and chair are his originals, and all around the room you see a reconstruction of those things that O'Neill wanted to keep closest at hand in his most personal space, down to the titles of the books in the library. Now, when he and Carlotta moved to California, O'Neill was hoping to create a cycle of plays that followed one American family in their arc through success and greed and eventual downfall. This began as a trilogy, which grew into five plays, which grew into seven, into 11. Well, that arc didn't end up getting completed. Well, here, it didn't end up getting completed at all. As his creative drive was rising, his health began to fail. He had a tremor that was diagnosed in his life as Parkinson's, but that we now know was a familial tremor inherited from his mother's side of the family. It made writing very difficult for him. We have here an example of his handwriting. At the start of his career, in the middle years, and down here at the bottom, this is only as much as he could control his hand while working here at Dow House, only as large as he could make those marks. And making even these marks was a tremendous strain. So, realizing that this work of an interconnected story over hours and hours of historical research and writing was probably not something that he had the strength of the will to complete, he sets the cycle aside and begins focusing in on work of unparalleled autobiography. Ideas about his family and his own personal past that he circles around through much of his career, well, they come into crystal focus here in the study of Dow House. A friend of Jean's, hoping to ease the discomfort of writing, provided for him a dictaphone machine into which he could speak and perhaps work out some of the ideas in his head through recording them. Well, that didn't end up coming into fruition. O'Neill said that he thought that he wrote best with a pencil in his hand. But what it has provided for us is the opportunity to play for you a section of Long Day's Journey into Night in O'Neill's own voice. It is, in fact, the character of Edmund, the member of the Tyrone family that O'Neill styled after himself. And so in this passage, what we have is O'Neill, the author, giving O'Neill, the character, words that he most wants to speak. I'd like to play that for you now. You've just told me some high spots in your memory. Want to hear mine? They're all connected with the sea. Here's one. When I was on the square head, square rigger, bound for Buenos Aires. Full moon in the trains, the old hooker driving 14 knots. I lay on the bowsprit, facing a stern, with the water foaming and the spume under me. The mass with every sail white in the moonlight towering high above me. I became drunk with the beauty and singing rhythm of it. For a moment I lost myself, actually lost my life. I was set free. I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray. Became beauty and rhythm, became moonlight in the ship in the high, dim, starred sky. I belonged without past or future, within peace and unity and a wild joy, within something greater than my own life or the life of man, the life itself. To God, if you want to put it that way. Through the voice of Edmund, O'Neill gives shape to his most formative memories. And as we look around the study, do we see his Pulitzer Prizes hanging? Where is his Nobel medallion? No, the only award, so to speak, that he's displaying is that piece of paper right there. It's his discharge papers from the last ship that he ever sailed on. They say that he had earned the rank of able-bodied seaman and could keep watch and work unsupervised. It hangs beneath models of two of the vessels that O'Neill sailed on. And he also hangs a photo of himself in his American Lines jersey, the sweater he was issued when he first signed on with the crew. 
And for a playwright who was so commercially successful and critically lauded, that what was most important to him were these early memories of his experiences, finding meaning in the sea, finding purpose and a sense of belonging on a ship. Well, that's quite a profound personal revelation. In fact, O'Neill found Long Day's Journey into Night so personal that he had it sealed away, declaring that he didn't want it published for at least 25 years after his death and never performed. Well, O'Neill does die, and Carlotta decides that there is greater value in the work being released than being kept secret. So she works to have it published, and works to have it performed. And last wishes aside, it was this play that redefined O'Neill's career for a whole new generation of theater goers. His star was beginning to fade at the end of his life. The strides that he had made in pushing the boundaries of playwriting in his time were, funnily enough, seen as old-fashioned by the end of his career. His last plays that were produced were not well received, and without Carlotta's decision to release Long Day's Journey in Tonight, it's very possible that we wouldn't even be standing here in this room thinking about this figure as an important American and an important American playwright, someone who changed what could be done with the medium. By 1944, the O'Neills begin to realize that life here at Dow House is becoming unsustainable. America's entry into World War II makes finding help difficult. Their handyman and chauffeur, Herbert Freeman, who came with them from Georgia, well, he enlists, is called up, and suddenly they find themselves without anyone to drive them from their home up here in the hills down to the cities for supplies and their increasingly regular doctor appointments. So they move, first to San Francisco, then to New York City, then to Boston, where on November 27, 1953, Eugene O'Neill will die in room 401 of the Hotel Sheridan. His last words are said to be, I knew it, I knew it, born in a hotel room and died in a hotel room. In those years in between life in Dow House and death in Boston, O'Neill is unable to work, unable to write. His strength is that low, his health has failed that much. And for someone who so understood themselves through the lens of art, who processed their feelings about the world around them through the process of playwriting, those are hard years. They're hard years for us even to read about in a biography. But what we can also read, and what might be more true than any biography ever could be, is the incredible body of work that O'Neill left behind, plays which speak even today to the deepest truths about the human experience. And now you can say that you've been in the home where the most remarkable of those plays were written. Hi everyone, good morning from Dan. All right, thank you everyone. That was wonderful. That was like a, a lot of great info in there. We didn't tell you everything though, so you still have to come visit in person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a, a masterful balance in that in that regard. Um, should we uh, get to some questions? Sure. Um, before we do, I wanted to mention also that I believe is is the chat visible to everyone with the links that I put in there? Yeah. 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 So the links that I posted are um, if you want to make reservations to visit in person, that's the first one. The next one um, is a link to some historic photos. If any of you know, if you're curious about any of the things we showed in the video, and there's much, much more there, um, photos from our collection. And then uh, the next is our, our partner organization, the Eugene O'Neill Foundation. They um, put on performances of O'Neill's plays in the old barn um, at our historic site. We're one of um, two national historic sites, uh, park sites that has performances of plays 
Um, we do that every September as part of the O'Neill Festival. And you can watch some of the monologues that were filmed around the grounds um, from Eugene O'Neill's place. And then the last link is um, some of the videos that we have on YouTube. Um, we have a virtual hike on there that you can do. One is um, with videos and then the other one is just a full podcast where you can listen to it um, hiking anywhere you want. That's awesome. Yeah, and everyone can look at those links right there in the Facebook chat. Um, well, I, I certainly have my own questions and things that came up, but also try to merge some of these with what might come up through the chat. Um, let's just get started with, with something. Uh, what makes, if I, if I heard right, uh, O'Neill was the only American playwright to win the Nobel Prize for, for literature. Um, what makes that so? And also that sticks out to me, I wonder if it was as controversial as Bob Dylan winning it in 2017 <laughs> as sort of an entertainer, right? Was the scene as, uh, as a not right from the establishment of, of literary arts at the time? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I've heard that there was a lot of controversy surrounding it. Um, from what I recall reading about that time period, it was, um, it had, it felt like maybe a long time coming even because he had as, he written quite a huge body of work by 1936. Um, he co he completed his last six plays at Eugene O'Neill uh, at at our park uh, at Dow House. So up until then, he had completed you know forty something plays. So um, wasn't a surprise, I don't think, to anybody. But it is incredible that um, no one has since won the Nobel Prize for playwriting, um, given that we've had so many amazing uh, playwrights that came after him. He also, by the way, has uh, four Pulitzer Prizes, one of which he won posthumously for uh, Long Day's Journey in Tonight. I think more controversial are the, uh, the themes and subject matters of O'Neill's plays. He wrote about a lot of things that people had never seen on stage before, um, addressed themes of you know, common working people and interracial marriage, addiction, um, political uprising. Um, so a lot of things that uh, were very controversial and never uh, seen on a stage before. Yeah, and in many ways, I think that uh, what you just mentioned last there is sort of the reputation that precedes his work uh, is that it sort of stood out for, for those reasons. Uh, another question um, we have here was, how his themes might, how those sorts of themes might be reflected at the site. I mean, there's a lot we can draw from that we saw in the video, but to you, how are the themes of his work reflected on site? Um, I think the one that most stands out that we refer to all the time really is um, the theme of feeling belong, a sense of belonging in oneself and also in one's surroundings. Um, the recording that we played um, in the video, which is of Eugene O'Neill reading from Long Day's Journey in Tonight, he's just had a really, really amazingly terrible day with his family arguing, finding out that he has tuberculosis, confronting his own mortality, and um, uh, really kind of grappling with family dysfunction and problems, addiction and is um, having this kind of moment of elation at the end of the night, talking to his father about uh, some time that he spent on a ship um, sailing and feeling this sense of uh, belonging with the world. Um, and I like to say at the end of my tour, usually that I, I love O'Neill's work because not only can we identify with those themes of pain and angst and um, suffering that all um, humans, endure in some way or another, but um, he also points out that that pain and suffering leads to a greater understanding of ourselves and a greater understanding of beauty when we see it. Yeah. Um, and then of course, you know, those themes of, you know, addiction and um, embracing our world around us also and thinking about how we are affected by our surroundings. Um, 
we see that all over the site as well. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I noticed um, I noticed here that we have a follow up from the Facebook chat regarding um, accolades. Was he known not to care about those accolades? Uh, the ranger in the video, I presume they mean mentioned discharge papers were displayed. I feel that O'Neill was a very private person um, when it came to the public, but he did recognize his fame. And um, I'm sure, I would, I would be making a personal um, statement and feeling like it's more of like, this is just my observation. It seems like he didn't want to interface directly with the public or uh, with the press and didn't uh, want it to be, I guess, modest or not necessarily have that sort of um, celebrity but I think that it made him proud. And I think that um, Carlotta especially was very proud of their success. And, um, you know, you have to make a living also. He made a lot of money producing his plays and was able to live his life as a successful artist. And there are very few artists that can do what they love and be financially successful, especially during the Great Depression. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, of course, that larger uh, nationwide context really does make some of those things, it puts them into perspective, certainly. Um, yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, the, the bed was mentioned in the video and, and touched on a bit, but how much of what's on site generally was there during O'Neill's life? Do you want to take that one, Hillary? I'll give it a go and maybe you can jump in. I have not been at Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site near as long as Tori has. Um, so uh, this is a frequent question and I'm glad somebody asked. Um, so much of what is in the house today, you saw in those videos, you saw a combination of some historic photos and then also photos of what you would see if you came on a tour today. We wanted to kind of give you that balance of Eugene's life, but also, um, a tour today in, in any case. So much of what is in the house is not original. It is period appropriate pieces. So they are old, historic, interesting in their own right that are similar or almost the same as items we know the O'Neills had. Of course, that big exception being the bed and a couple of other smaller pieces in the house. Um, I like to tell folks that, and kind of like we mentioned in the video, we have these really rich diaries that both Eugene and Carlotta were keeping that help us give, give us some indirect information to knowing what their home environment was like, but also we do have some other um, documentation that tells us like what they were purchasing, the colors, things were being painted. So it's kind of a combination of information that has helped our cultural resources folks recreate those scenes for visitors who come today. That uh, the writing desk and blue chair are oh, also yes. original, which are a very important piece of furniture, but otherwise, yes, Hillary, perfect. <laughs> Thank you for adding the desks in, yep. That's such an interesting, um amalgamation of things there and, and in the video the showcase of um, his handwriting as it developed as well even to just have the examples like that that have survived so well is um, very interesting and also a testament to the great work that that you folks do um, let's see uh, yeah what what perceptions do people have of uh, Eugene O'Neill when they come to the site are a lot of your visitors um, folks who are great fans of American theater and remember and know are all about him or people wondering why this is a historic site and who is this and what's the balance like there? Do you want me to jump in, Tori? Go for it. Yeah, um, so we get, you know, visitors uh, from coming from all different points of interest. I would say, uh, well, a large portion of our visitors are folks who love visiting national parks and they know we're one of those 424 and they want to come and see it and know more about them. And then we, uh, because of the location, we are kind of in this semi urban environment. We get a lot of locals, which is really great. And then we do get some folks who studied English in college or saw one of his plays. So it's really a spectrum of folks um, who are coming to visit the site. Um, and I apologize, I blinked on what else I was going to say. So Tori, if you have anything to add, please jump in. 
Um, yeah, I think that that tends to be the majority of at local folks and the national parks fans um, because of the Asian influence and the design and furniture and the name Dow House, we do tend to get visitors who are curious about that connection to, um, to Asian culture. Uh, these days, it's more of we, we, we kind of view it as a like appropriation of Asian culture. Uh, but there are some really beautiful pieces in the house um, to see. And it's interesting to think about um, the influence of Asian culture on the culture of California during World War II and um, beyond and before as well. Yeah, you hit right on uh, another question that was upcoming, um, which was what that looks like, the Asian influence, it, it, how, to what extent is it cultural appropriation? To what extent did he, like other um, famous American writers of the uh, 19th and 20th century have a legitimate interest in um, East Asian philosophy? And is there much to be said about that? Um, so according to journals and statements made by O'Neill and Car Eugene O'Neill and Carlotta O'Neill, um, Carlotta said she'd been studying Asian art since she was a young girl. Um, Eugene O'Neill was interested in a variety of cultures and, um, and philosophy. He, uh, he and Carlotta um, traveled to various countries, including China and Japan. Um, you might have noticed the masks as you entered the house. Um, O'Neill was a huge collector of masks from all different um, countries as he was visiting and friends would pick them up as gifts for him. Um, and then the O'Neills would both wear Asian um, clothing in the house um, as they lounged around. He had a writing jacket that was a, a silk uh, writing jacket that we have in our collection that we put on display sometimes. Uh, they did have one fairly close friend uh, of Chinese descent, um, but kind of looking at the overall arching, the overarching picture of it, it was very fashionable at that time for um, Americans to travel and show off their worldliness by um, having things from a variety of countries, including Asia. And um, so, you know, I don't feel that their love and knowledge of, of Chinese culture that was contemporary to their time was very deep. I, I, I haven't been able to find a lot of evidence of their connection to um, you know, contemporary Asian folks. They did go to Chinatown to pick up furniture at Gump's and go shopping. And um, they talk about that, but not a whole lot about people that they knew or um, investigation into what it was like to, um, to live near there. Um, so yeah. I yeah, think that's, uh, it's, it's a valid question that uh, definitely deserves more research. Um, the more I learn about the, um, the Asian population and our Asian people in California and our history, I think um, it's, it's a very important group of people to uh, the way that our, our, our state has developed um, in a variety of ways and in our national parks in particular too. I can yeah, definitely put a link to some um, to some things in that regard as well, um, because I think that's a very important part of our national parks history. That's awesome. That's a very nuanced answer. And it did certainly, I'm, as, I'm, as you've mentioned, it surely sticks out for, for many people because I was wondering um, though, though you've just delved into it, but it's like, was Eugene O'Neill uh, a precursor of Gary Snyder or, or something? Was there some sort of, but as you're saying it, it's, a different level of seriousness or different kind of interest maybe in those in those cultures. Um, yes. Yeah, let's see here. Um, okay, what, what do you want people to generally take away? Uh, and what suggestions might you have uh, for people to keep in mind if they want to come visit? Um, I think that I hope that um, people take away the, the depth in which Eugene O'Neill um, really investigated the human mind, particularly his own, um, and the idea that psychology and, um, and drama go hand in hand. 
I think that his influence on American drama is just that, that we are all able to investigate our own selves and search our own souls um, with his influence. And that his influence has kind of spread into what we consider modern uh, drama. Um, a lot of a lot of that um, openness came from him investigating so deeply. And I feel like our site is a good place to have that peace and quiet and also have that, um, that space to, to think about our own selves and, and, how, um, and how we can connect with our surroundings and with each other. So um, things to keep in mind when visiting our site, we are only open Wednesday through Sunday. We have tours at 10 o'clock and two o'clock. We require reservations every day except for Saturday. Um, on Saturday, um, we just meet at the, the shuttle stop and pick up whoever's there up to you know, however many we can fit in our vehicle. Um, and the, the tours last about an hour, hour and a half. Um, you can walk through the house and then explore the grounds as well. Um, and we shuttle everyone into the site in our park vehicle. Um, no one can access the park with their private vehicle. You can also hike up. There is a surrounding regional park land. Um, and there are a couple different trailheads that you can take, uh, to, can start at to get up to our park. Um, also, uh, people can ride bicycles, but it's very hilly, very steep. <laughs> Be forewarned. Well, that's uh, great to keep in mind. And um, barring any further questions from the chat, making sure I'm not missing anything, I think I'll lead into our final question. This has been a great presentation, and like the video is awesome. You guys have been great with the questions. And um, so we'd like to have our final question be asking um, you, Tori and, and Hillary, um, maybe how you got to where you are at this site and if you had any advice from that for someone else watching who might want to work in a similar field and talk about similar histories. Would you like to start, Hillary? Sure. I'm trying to like gather my thoughts. Um, I guess I'll kind of give like a very brief rundown of like my bio background. Um, so I have an undergraduate and master's degree in bioarchaeology. Um, so I've studied you know, ancient human history and just in general history has always been very fascinating and intriguing to me. And then I, um, if I can be so bold, say I, I enjoy and I'm good at speaking with people to people um, and in this case about people. And so finding myself several years ago at a very, at a very different site working in what I now know to be historical interpretation, I've had, you know, a few different jobs along the way. I'm now with my second position with the National Park Service. And um, I don't know if I have a direct answer, like how exactly I ended up here, but I would say that if you have an interest in historical and natural resources and you love speaking to people, historical interpretation is a great place to try to land. Thanks, Hillary. Um, yeah, I think that the majority of interpretive park rangers, uh, like myself and Hillary, we come to this from a variety of different places and paths. Um, I've known interpretive rangers who have de degrees in biology, um, archaeology, ecology, arts, uh, my bachelor's in illustration, my master's is in exhibit design. Um, I'm, I come at uh, the national parks from a standpoint of how do I connect, how do I solve the problem of connecting people to history and to nature? And there's a variety of different ways I can do that through speaking, through writing, through interpretive displays and uh, museum collections, through working with our community, involving them and um, getting making sure that our information and our, our presentations are relevant, um, engaging with community partners and with our park partners. Um, those are all things that are part of my job that I, I love very much. Um, and working with a variety of age groups and people from all over the world 
Um, it's, it's really exciting work and very rewarding. And um, it's just amazing to see people make connections um, to our, our parks themes and, um, and to us and to each other. Um, I think Eugene O'Neill is a, um, a site where, you know, our, we have a very small amount of visitors who can come at one time because of the transportation. We have to bring them in our park shuttle. So the tours tend to be very intimate um, and people get to know each other and get to know um, about our park. Uh, much like Eugene O'Neill's plays, which tended to be rather intimate and um, you know, smaller audiences, very spare set design. Um, so I feel like we kind of continue in that tradition of, of O'Neill with connecting people to each other. It's, it's an amazing thing to see an O'Neill play. And I do recommend if you can ever see one in person, please do, um, because it's really, it's something because you feel like you are a part of the performance. Um, the play could, we, I, I talked with Ranger Altman at one point and we were talking about how um, there's, there's the written play and then there's the play as it's performed and then there's the play as it's received by the audience and all those things are happening at the same time when you're in a performance and you're getting multiple levels and layers of that art coming to life it's just really amazing yeah that's awesome and i think a lot of that has certainly come through uh today even over zoom and uh i know i look forward to getting the chance to come to the site in person um and see these things and have those kinds of great interactions. Uh, I think it's great when our historic sites can mirror art and keep these sort of uh, connections and intimacies alive. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, Tori and Hilary. Uh, you guys have been great today. Thanks for uh, taking the time. Of course, thank you for having us and inviting us to speak. We really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, and for everyone, uh, watching at home. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll see you next week with the National History Academy at the same time as we continue to explore America's great historical landscapes. Thanks, everyone.